Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of Big Ideas webinars. These programs are part of our planning and preparation for marking the 250th anniversary of the founding of the United States. I'm Sarah Curitan, Executive Director of the New Jersey Historical Commission, and it's my honor today to welcome you to this program. Revolution NJ, a partnership between the Commission and the nonprofit Crossroads of the American Revolution, is dedicated to advancing the role that history plays in public discourse, community engagement, education, tourism, and scholarship in New Jersey. Through programs like this one, we seek to explore the history of the American Revolution, its context, its legacy as well, and thereby galvanize diverse audiences statewide into embracing the enduring value and relevance of history. Now today we consider another one of those big ideas that impact the way we understand the past, the way we perceive, perceive our lives today, and the way we envision the future. To get us started, I'm delighted to turn the program over to our program coordinator, Dr. Mark Lawrence. Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as Sarah mentioned, this is our third panel session in the Big Ideas Concepts for the 250th series, uh, and we're excited to host the conversation today with our panelists concerning what truly is a big idea. How does society shape individual actions? Um, a lot of time and research has been put into exploring this question over the years with scholars from many disciplines and backgrounds exploring how things such as culture, society, and the individual intertwine. From the print capitalism and imagined communities discussed by Benedict Anderson in his work on the rise of nationalism during the Industrial Revolution, to the digital age of big data and filter bubbles uh, that inhabit our daily lives. Our sense of self is both subtly and overtly shaped by what we read, see, and hear in our day-to-day -day lives. We also have seen the inverse, tremendous efforts by individuals and organizations to respond and shape society itself. Under these circumstances, what does it really mean to be an individual living in a society? What is at stake in this discussion? And why should we all care about this? Today, our panels will dive into these questions, exploring how our day-to-day -day experiences are shaped by a number of internal and external forces, the implications of which, as you will hear, have far-reaching consequences not only in the present, but also for our understanding of the past and what we can imagine for the future. Thinking systemically and structurally allows us to critically engage topics and issues with a more holistic understanding of the various factors that push and pull people towards certain actions, beliefs, and circumstances. It helps us make sense of the patterns we see on the ground and question the ways power is enacted, protected, and embedded in our laws, policies, social structures, and practices. To grapple with the consequences of such concentration, what is often called an approach to understanding structural violence is key to making substantive changes in the world we live in. As we approach our commemoration of the 250th founding of the United States, we urge folks to wrestle with these issues, exploring how individuals and organizations throughout New Jersey's history and also folks in the present are grappling with these revolutionary ideas outlined in our constitution. I hope that you'll approach today's conversation with the same openness to new ideas that we have urged in our past panel sessions, and that you bring this approach into your own work, exploring ways in which you can take some of the ideas discussed today and shaping some of the work that you're doing. With that being said, I have the distinct privilege of introducing our moderator, Kristen Scorzone. Kristen, Kristen Scorzone is a PhD candidate in American Studies at Rutgers Newark, focusing on African American women's history, LGBTQ history, urban history, and public history. As a graduate assistant for the Queer Newark Oral History Project, they have assisted in the curation of a Queer Newark exhibit, designed and led walking tours, and produced and hosted the Queer Newark podcast. The writing has appeared in the Public Historian um, History at Work also. We are excited to have Kristen join us today as the moderator. Please join me in welcoming them to today's panel session. Thanks so much. Thanks for that intro, Mark. Um, so, and then I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. Um, first up, uh, Professor Tara Yasso. Um, Professor Tara Rasso's research examines access to educational opportunities for students of color at critical transition points in their schooling trajectories. For example, uh, high school to community college, baccalaureate to doctorate. 
Um, her research seeks to recover counter narratives of race, schooling, inequality, and the law. She is specifically interested in the ways people of color has, have historically utilized an array of knowledges, skills, abilities, and networks, uh, community cultural wealth, and to survive and resist racism and other forms of subordination. Her community cultural wealth model has been received nationally and internationally as a paradigm shift for the ways we have traditionally thought about schooling structures, practices, and discourse. She is a first generation college student and a professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Riverside. Um, our other panelist today is Dr. Jonathan Rosa, who is an associate professor of education, comparative race and ethnic studies, and by courtesy anthropology, linguistics and comparative literature at Stanford University. He is the author of Looking Like a Language, Sounding Like a Race, Racial Linguistic Ideologies and the Learning of Latinidad, and co-editor co of the volume Language and Social Justice in Practice. Um, his work has been published in scholarly journals such as the Harvard Educational Review, American Ethnologist, uh, Journal of Linguistic Anthropology, and Language and Society, as well as featured in media outlets including the New York Times, The Nation, NPR, and Univism. So thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to jump right in with the questions. Uh, so, um, you know, the big main idea question for this panel is what is the relationship between society and individual actions and beliefs? So, you know, to our panelists, why do you, why does it matter to explore this question? Um, I guess, um, if, do either of you want to go first or do you want me Go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> well, I guess I'm, ha I'm happy to jump in first. Thank you for the, the introduction. It's, it's wonderful to have the chance to share with everyone this morning. Um, just in, in terms of this, this opening dialogue about the, why this is an important discussion to have, to me, the, the, these debates or these discussions surrounding individualism and, and society are, are so important because uh, I, they shape our understanding about, you know, the, the the world in which we live, the structures that we've inherited, and the question of whether these are the best structures for us, whether they protect us, whether they support collective well-being, um, and whether these are the only ones that we could have or that ever have existed, or whether there are many other possibilities, many other ways of organizing economies, ways of organizing governance ways of sustaining one another's collective well-being. And so um, at, the, at the outset of the discussion, for me, um, part of the stakes of this conversation are a question of, yeah, what, what kind of world we have to live in or, or what kind of world we could be living in? Uh, and in what ways have people already been experimenting for centuries um, with the, the creation of alternative worlds and, and different approaches to organizing everyday life? And so, yeah, just at the, at the beginning for me, it's, it's a, you know, um, raising some, some significant questions about how we each came to understand ourselves as individuals, what we think of as defining our individualism and, uh, and, and question, raising some questions about whether um, those, those ideas about what make us individuals are in fact a reflection of very specific historical moments, very specific societal structures, very specific context. And so maybe what we've thought for so long was a reflection of our individual character, who each of us is, is in fact a reflection of a particular kind of way of organizing life. And, you know, and, and if we were to rethink that, there would be many other possibilities that we could be we could be open to. Yeah, I completely agree with that because I feel like and I feel like we don't need to have all the solutions right away either. It's just important to start asking different questions of what we know and the structures that are in place. Um, Dr. Yasso, what do you think? I definitely um, the I the asking the questions of what we know and also how we know. Um, I and how did we come to know? I know that that's going to be also a panel just to give a plug for later on on these um, these webinars. For me, it is um, very present of mind that we are connected across time and place, and we are often made to believe that we are uh, not connected. And to the extent that we feel disconnected 
Um, it, it can be very unmooring. And uh, that is, so how we organize our schools and the teaching of history in particular, or how we organize museum exhibits and how it portrays history and who is included in some of those exhibits and who is not included in, in some of those exhibits, um, those are all reflections of how we came to know and what we know. I think that there are many things that do bind us individually together. And some of us get um, affirmed in that. So when we have an understanding as a very, very young children have the um, individual understanding of what is right and what is wrong. And in kindergarten, there's, you know, this uh, a super emphasis on, you know, how do we form lines and how does that make your, you know, your friend feel when you jumped in front of them in line, right? We begin with this in very individual and then how that individual um, will react if another individual impedes on their freedom, right? <laughs> on their right to be there without someone's you know, sticking something on them or, you know, touching them in a way that they didn't, all of these things that we learn in, in, in kindergarten. Um, and that, that poster, I definitely agree with everything I need to know in life. I learned in kindergarten, but many of us have had these, these traditions um, passed down to us well before we darkened the door of school. And so how we learn to engage with our elders, different storytelling traditions that we bring forward, ancient knowledges uh, that we may not connect yet as ancient knowledge of ways of knowing, we do bring those with us to school and in those environments. And so there is uh, the passing on of these knowledges that it may feel like it's occurring in an individual way, passing on within kinship networks, passing on from teacher to student, from student to student. Uh, but what we are, what we are really uh, doing is sharing knowledge in ways that, um, as, as Dr. Rosa reminds us, uh, different cultures have done differently across time and place. And, uh, and, there, and not one way of sharing that knowledge is better than another. And so the what I when I talk about that concept of community cultural wealth, this idea is really that there is a difference between what um, Pierre Bourdieu talked about as cultural capital of, of some limited forms of knowledge and how those forms of knowledge are passed on in ways that reproduce hierarchy in society that folks with uh, power in society, name certain forms of knowledge as important, and then only restrict and ma maintain as exclusive those forms of knowledge. This is an individual form of knowledge hoarding that he describes as um, a way that hierarchy or inequality in society reproduces itself. And community cultural wealth disrupts this concept by identifying some of the ways of knowing, not just that have been under acknowledged, but that these very ways of knowing and passing and sharing knowledge have been a means of survival and resistance across centuries. And so it's, it's at tension with what we know, how the individual and the society continue to interact and how these ways of knowing are uh, important for us to constantly interact and to share these ways of knowing uh, as a means of our survival and resistance. Yeah, that's so important. I, I really resonate with that as someone who does oral history for, for the Queer Newark Oral History Project, because that is that is a community of cultural wealth, like all of these stories that we have in this repository. And for me as a queer and trans person, it's really great to see myself when I'm doing an oral history and someone else that's telling me their story. It's, you know, obviously it gives you empathy, but then also they have this other knowledge that I don't have about their experience being queer or trans or, um, and then the other intersecting identities that go along with that, like race and ethnicity and, and religion and ability and all of that. Um, and I think by looking at folks, what they have to say firsthand and valuing them as experts um, is like a really great way to start doing this, like a reimagining together of what we can do differently in our society and what's possible and what people are already 
working on and doing and changing about the structures in place. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with both of you. Um, it was really great uh, to hear your thoughts. Um, what do you think about um, how uh, individualism has been defined within the United States? Um, like what are the contradictions and what kind of nation has emerged as a result? Do you wanna speak on that, uh, Professor uh, Ross, Rosa? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to jump in again. Yeah, so this is where the, the rubber meets the road with these questions when we say, okay, so individualism has been defined in many different ways, in many different contexts. So if the United States, if the contemporary United States is one such context, or if the United States more, more broadly across its history is one context, then how has individualism been defined here? And, you know, I, I think we've got to ask some really serious questions about how the notion of liberalism that organizes the United States, the definition of freedom that is, uh, I think, in, in trying has been enshrined in the United States, we got to, We've got to think really carefully about whose experiences have been honored by that, have been reflected by that, have been supported by the ideas about individual freedom. Um, that have organized the United States since its creation. And I think when we look really carefully across the entirety of US history, and I wanna be clear, the entirety of US history, we can start to recognize some very clear patterns about whose freedoms have been protected, whose individualism has been supported and, and whose hasn't, you know? And, and um, to me, the, we've, we've got to start to think really carefully about the ways that in the US and many other contexts, uh, many other liberal contexts, individualism and freedom have been defined in terms of the capacity to consume and to accumulate. And as Dr. Yasso puts it, to hoard, frankly, in very particular ways, to accumulate by, to be clear, dispossession. And so these modes of accumulation take place at the cost or at the expense or through the exploitation of various other people's experiences. And so um, when freedom has been defined in this way, when individualism has been defined in this way, it creates a, a deeply hierarchical society, a deeply precarious society. And when we look across the United States at all of its institutions, if we wanna talk about education, criminal justice, electoral politics, housing, health, any sector across the United States, when we look in, 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 across those spaces and, and pay attention to race, class, gender, uh, sexuality, uh, uh, ability across these spaces, we start to recognize we've got some structures that have not been protecting people. And I, I, I think about this specific moment right now, a COVID moment in the last few years and where the rates of death in the United States outpaced the rest of the world by far, absolutely incomparable. And as a nation, we've got to ask ourselves some really serious questions as we approach 1 million deaths with virtually no co collective commemoration. And this is where we could think about how, how we go in a different direction to actually kind of honor the lives of people that have been lost because we didn't have structures, a public health infrastructure and broader resource infrastructures in place to protect well being in the context of, of a pandemic. And when we look across the world, it's very clear that in other societal contexts, there are other approaches to collecting well or to, to supporting collective well-being and so um yeah i would just i would i would start to pay attention to a few different dynamics i mean we could if we look at incarceration the us is what five percent of the world the world's population demographically 20 percent of its incarcerated population what individualism have we created here what freedom have we created here you know and and if we just account for this in terms of individual behaviors that doesn't help us to explain these sorts of structural, systematic structural uh, patterns. And that's where an institutional analysis or a structural or a systemic analysis becomes absolutely essential because this isn't simply a matter of, we either have to, to, to suggest that the United States is this space where we have a uniquely criminalizing uh, uh, populace, therefore that needs to be contained in these ridiculously, ridiculously uh, um, inequitable and disparate ways, or we've got some structures that have been designed to collect people and to constrain freedom in really specific ways. And then we would have to ask, well, whose freedom has been constrained? And historically, how has that, how, how have those sorts of, of, of structures, again, supported the accumulation of resources for very specific populations and not others? And then finally, I might even look in the contemporary moment right now 
where we see lots of debates, for example, about critical race theory in mainstream schools and the, the teaching of critical race theory, which is sort of a misnomer. The debate is a misnomer because, of course, critical race theory is a legal theory that is often taught at the, at the earliest in higher education, um, but often not until graduate school from some perspectives. And so there are some spaces in, in K through 12 where people might touch on different insights, but critical race theory has not been an organizing sort of uh, curriculum in mainstream US schools. I think a lot of people are using the phrase critical race theory to refer to anything related to race. But part of what's at stake in that debate, I think, from some perspectives is the question of whether the United States is an inherently racist society and, and you know, the, the debate about whether teaching the teaching around different sorts of racist histories and, and contemporary realities, whether that prevents us from recognizing people's individual identities. And this is the this is, I think, the way the debate is often framed that if we teach people that they are just their race then you know, what kind of message are we delivering them? Which to be clear, I think from any critical race analysis, whether it's critical race theory or another framework, the message isn't to tell people that they are only their race. I think the, the question is, how is it that racist structures and, and structures of racialization have shaped our experiences, have shaped, have created particular patterns? And we should be able to recognize these patterns again across every single sector of everyday life without a race analysis these, uh, without an institutional race analysis, these structures shouldn't make sense to us. We need a race analysis to understand these disparate, highly disparate patterns. Now, note, you have this debate about critical race theory in mainstream schools at the same time as you have a debate about anti-trans laws or an policies around trans and, and, uh, uh, and queer phobic sorts of um, educational discussions, right? So the, the question of whether we should be able to, to uh, um, address uh, uh, human the diversity of human sexualities in mainstream schools and the question of whether trans families whether uh, families with with trans children should be able to have access to gender affirming health care um, and so this is where you start to see the contradiction in how freedom has been defined when particular freedoms are advanced freedoms of gender expression freedoms of um, uh, expression of sex one sexual identity then that is not acceptable in mainstream schools and in, in mainstream spaces so we uh, but when it comes to race uh, we're, we're you know we're not allowed to, to to kind of talk about race as a structuring systematic process because it allegedly prevents us from recognizing that everyone has an individual identity but then when people attempt to articulate and uh, and enact their and express their individual identities in relation to race and and uh, and sorry gender and sexuality in particular ways those are unacceptable and that's where you start to see the contradiction this is not simply about supporting freedom it's supporting very particular forms of freedom freedom that's defined in relation to specific societal norms a, a set of gender binaries that are involved in the reproduction of an idea of a nuclear family which is involved in the reproduction of a particular economic set of economic structures and so the policing of gender norms and the policing of queer identities is about the maintenance of a very particular family unit that is imagined as uh, as being necessary in order to reproduce this nation in very specific terms uh, again in terms that serve specific populations well-being that lead to specific modes of accumulation by dispossession. And so um, I, I think recognizing these contradictions across the entirety of US history, that means not just assuming that we're on this continued trajectory towards progress, that simply has not been the case. And even if you look at landmark moments, civil rights era, Brown versus the Board of Education, we think of these as landmark moments. Well, schools are, many schools are more segregated now than they were when segregation was legal. So at what point do we start to recognize that we need more comprehensive societal change and structural change in order to produce different outcomes. And, and this, this critical analysis of the United States for me is not simply about railing against the United States as an end in itself. It's about really taking seriously our ability to create something different, to create different systems that support and, um, and protect collective well-being, both domestically and globally, because that's, and maybe that's where I would end my response to this. We have to be very careful about defining progress simply within the United States, because often progress here happens at the expense of our relationships with nations globally. And so, um, you know, even we celebrated the, the election of our very first woman vice president and, and woman of color vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, which, you know, is an incredible sign, uh, could be an, in some regards an incredible sign of progress. 
However, within Kamala Harris's first few months in office, now note Kamala Harris, who is the daughter of immigrants on both sides of her family, Caribbean immigrant, so South Asian, uh, she's our first black and South Asian vice president. And within her first few months of office, she goes in sent to Central America and says, don't come. And she's the daughter of immigrants and she is and, and she's understood as this sign of progress, but then she inhabits this structure that is inherently exclusionary. And that's where we need a structural analysis. So this individual might be a sign of progress, but the structure hasn't transformed. So that in order to be the vice president, you have to reproduce or there's the expectation that you're going to reproduce some very troublesome norms where the daughter of immigrants is now telling people don't come. That's a really, really, that's something we have to think very critically about. Um, and, and it's why um, just sort of thinking that it, moving different individuals into the same structures will produce change. No, we need to transform these structures. Yeah, I agree 100%. I resonate with what you said about um, critical race theory and the anti-trans bills and, you know, don't say gay in Florida and all these things. And like, I, you know, politicians do these, like spew this rhetoric for a number of reasons. And definitely I think part of it is because they don't want us to think about how power it operates in this country and like how, you know, our country's structurally organized to benefit more like affluent people. And, and of course, politicians are part of that. And, um, and, you know, they're, they're these, this rhetoric is like constructing truths about our society that aren't real and that actually have an impact on people's material lives. Um, so it's really important to question these things, but I'd like to hear what um, Dr. Yasso thinks. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosa, for, um, for those remarks. Uh, for me, I really also want to kind of bring it, if he's looking at all of these different um, institutions that we have in society and really calling our attention to the structures and practices and discourse. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about uh, putting forward ideas that will go into this kind of commemoration of the 250th, to really think about why uh, politicians are emphasizing education, many of whom do not have kids who went to public schools, do not have any children at this point um, who are uh, the age uh, uh, of going to school and or have benefited greatly from increased access and opportunity that was fought for in the 1960s to make sure that they had uh, to not go into deep debt in order to get the education that they have in order to have access and opportunity. And so when we think about schooling, schools really are the ways in which we take individuals in our society and we socialize them and we, be, we, we bring them through a series of structures and uh, everyday practices. And then we have a series of discourse that justify the unequal outcomes, the disparate access and opportunities that we put the majority of students through. And we keep this system upheld as a meritocracy, as if you work very hard so that, uh, that you will succeed. And that if you didn't work hard enough, then that is the reason why you are pushed out of school, right? We call that dropout, but it really is a push out of school. So kind of shifting our our lenses away from the individuals and individual choice that we make to understand these larger contexts, then we can see that there are these structures and practices in place that were put in place for very specific reasons so that we would, as Dr. Rosa reminds us, keep these specific economic structures and workings in place. Um, and in addition to that, uh, it is not an accident that you have Jaime who starts as a, uh, you know, kindergartner and his parents, um, his, his mother is uh, working in the service sector of the economy and his father is a carpenter and makes his way through school and works very hard all the way through school. And at the end of school, he has access to multiple woodshop classes in high school um, and he ends up being a carpenter. 
and his sister it works in the service sector of the economy. That does not happen on accident, but happens by design. And if one of Jaime's brothers or sisters goes to college, then we uphold that individual person and say, see, the system works. There, the meritocracy works. Jaime didn't work hard enough. His sister didn't work hard enough, but look at their little brother. He really got there, right? And of course, we want to celebrate their little brother. And But that doesn't take away from both of the parents working very hard, all of the children working very hard. And what is the continuity there is that there is a system that is failing at every level for, for that family in the majority of cases. It's those that very small uh, number of students that do make it through the educational system that then folks uphold. And so right now you're seeing a lot of a resurgence of policies that are trying to shut down access and opportunity to higher education and any efforts that uh, you see that are trying to shut down access of learning our histories more complex ways that we are connected across time and place are also being shut down. And so when we ask ourselves why that is that we have this hyper focus all of a sudden um, from folks who know nothing about the educational system and you rarely see educators who have been trained, then it really begins to put into focus what we think about when we think about these practices of socialization um, that, that when you look to scholars such as James Lowen and Lies My Teacher Told Me and other scholars who have uh, Jean Anion who talked about the different ways that there's a hidden curriculum in schools and how they are under preparing students by design. You think about the work of David G. Garcia with strategies of segregation, that this was purposeful to have residential segregation and, uh, and those racial covenants held by the same educators who were creating segregated schools, and that segregated schools look different all across the United States, and they happened uh, in ways that looked like integrated schools. Sometimes you have the Mexican classroom within an integrated school, and then African Americans placed with the Mexicans in that classroom. And then that's going to look different in different communities. And so that type of mundane racism, the systematic subordination of people of color as an everyday, matter of fact, commonplace way of doing business within and beyond schools is a system that is by design. And so as individuals move through that system, um, this is how we begin to see, as Dr. Rosa points out, that the, each individual um, has their individual agency to move that, and that you have also seen collective action across time and place where people have questioned the inequality of the conditions, not just focused on outcomes and blaming individuals for bad choices, but understanding that those choices are always made within constraints. And how might we think about changing access and opportunity, changing some of those structures in order to understand how we can change the, the larger picture? Um, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, um, I think that, actually is a good way to bring us to our next question it's like thinking about how people move within these constraints that are placed on them and so dr dr yosa maybe within an educational context or or however you want to talk about this but how can we call attention to the destructive systems in place by showcasing communities and movements of resistance and survivance and joy and hope throughout history um, and not just always have like this uh the emphasis on on oppression alone we do that by doing that, right? We, 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 we need to understand what the contexts of inequality are. And we also uh, cannot re-victimize victims who do not see themselves as victims but who, and who are survivors, right? We, of, of course, acknowledge that being pushed to the margins, that this is like, these are horrific acts that we have been racialized in relation to one another. The work of Natalia Molina helps us understand the racial scripts 
that are that were utilized against Native Americans to justify displacement and destruction and dehumanization, and that, that those racial scripts are picked up and then uh, deployed against another group in another time and place, right? So understanding that within those experiences, within those segregated schools, within those schools, um, those boarding schools, there is endurance, there is survival, there are ways, there are creative, um, clandestine, fierce ways of passing on knowledge and of uplifting one another. Uh, and uh, you see some of the this amazing work that historians are doing to recover these histories. We do not do a good enough job yet of taking these insights from uh, academics who have emphasized uh, ways in which people of color have played sports on their, on, on their days off. Um, some of the work of uh, Jose Alamillo talks about um, using different celebrations, cultural celebrations by folks who were working in the citrus industry in, in Corona and how they made lemonade out of lemons. Right? How do they make the best of this situation and reclaim some of their humanity by, by playing sports with each other on a Sunday and every other day of the week, they're just a quote worker, right? They are, they are seen as the less than in the community. And these are the places and spaces where they affirm one another's dignity. And you see examples of that across time and place. Yeah. 100%. I know, like, just individually alone, like, I look to queer stories and trans stories of survival during repressive times when I start feeling like this is this, like, what is happening in society with its COVID or, or presidency that's, that's causing chaos? Like, how did people survive during very repressive times and just still be people? Because there, there was joy during these times, too. Um, people did survive. So, like, how did they do that? What sort of strategies did they, did they take? Did they take to do that or like even just like people dancing at Stonewall and in, in front of police you know like recognizing that these things also happen too um Dr. Russo did you have um any thoughts as well on this I, I would just echo um Dr. Yoso's comments and, and your comments as well you know I I think that there are there are different narratives that are possible about what's going on in, in, in various kinds of institutional spaces. And, you know, we can look to different freedom struggles and, and to, to kind of call into question how it is that people have always pushed back against some of the systems that have they, they've developed an analysis and an awareness and a response, collective responses to the systems that they were facing. So as Dr. Yasso was putting it, regardless of whether we want to look um, in, in histories of colonization, at the creation of um, maroon societies um, organized by uh, runaway enslaved people and indigenous populations to create alternative sorts of systems, um, or whether uh, more contemporary freedom struggles. And we, we can trace a, a lineage of these struggles in which people have always pushed back. And I guess part of what the, the goal here is to, to disrupt this, this idea that progress is just a natural process but to instead recognize that people have been demanding fundamental transformation and that, you know, the idea that progress was just happening because people were, were growing kinder or been more benevolent. No, it has required struggle at every single moment um, in order to kind of rethink how these systems could work. So experimenting with ways of, of telling these freedom stories and, and really kind of re-narrating the, the history of different societal settings uh, across, again, across every institutional space I think telling those stories in a different way invites people to see themselves as actually having to, to uh, learn about those struggles, to learn what their role could be in maintaining the kind of, uh, and, and, and uh, protecting the, the kinds of freedoms that have been um, uh, developed and experimented with in these spaces. And so I think, you know, these, these educational projects can be incredibly transformative. They invite people to not just see themselves as in isolated individuals, but rather to see themselves as having inherited something, as being connected to something, and ha as having a responsibility to people in a fundamental 
fundamentally different way. And for me, when we're dealing with, you know, questions about kids across so many spaces who are so profoundly alienated, you know, I, I think, you know, this question of, of a collective inheritance and a question of collective responsibility for maintaining one another's well-being, um, these are these are our messages that we could communicate that that I think could help us to, to experiment and, and uh, or to continue with these um, experiments and freedom and experiments in, in the creation of, of, of alternative kinds of worlds. Yeah, um, and we just have like a few more minutes before the Q&A part of this. Um, so I just wanted to see like practically, like how would you recommend um, folks put these ideas into action? You know, how can, where can people start um, when it comes to thinking structurally and systemically? I know you, you both are obviously professors, like how do you, maybe how do you get your students to understand this? Um, and like, even like thinking about like sort of these like big commemoration efforts that are gonna be happening around the 25th, uh, 250th anniversary of the founding of the US. Um, you know, how can historical sites, schools, museums, public institutions sort of meet this moment? Um, Dr. Yasso, do you wanna, do you wanna start? I, I do think that uh, recognizing that students have been taught that they are disconnected from one another um, is a really important place to start to, to understand that we all have some learning to do. So I think that um, three things that I would emphasize um, would be intersegmental to think really, it, meaning that that if you're putting together an exhibit, um, how might it be uh, informing at different levels so that people can engage with it um, from, um, how would an elementary school student or would there be an, um, an element of this that the, you could take away um, a series of books that might add to what you're talking about in this exhibit? Middle school, high school, that's what I mean by intersegmental. Um, uh, then you look at the higher education level. I train teachers sometimes, and sometimes I'm working with uh, children. And so this kind of, how might you speak across multiple audiences um, to make sure that when you are putting together these histories, that they can be accessed by multiple audiences, because that, that, that is our larger goal. Um, and I do think that um, the idea of making sure that it's, when we think about the concept of history, um, that as students have been taught history, it has been um, usually, uh, as in 1977, the Council for Interracial Books reminded us that too often US history has perpetuated stereotypes, omissions, and distortions. And so if you go in knowing that, um, I would, err on the side of specificity when we're talking about history, if you're doing a community history, leaning into the layers of that, and then being aware and letting your audiences know that there are many more stories and histories that are out there. So if there is a tool that you might be able to provide for them to allow them to see that they can contribute to the recovery of history, that they also are active participants in making history. Those are really important takeaways um, with any kind of exhibit. And the third thing is, is that what you are doing is political and to not shy away from that recognition. Raising critical consciousness about who we are as a people and that, that we are connected uh, by structures that are deeply problematic and that people have constantly pushed back on those structures is a political act of defiance, especially during a time when we are uh, being told to oversimplify, flatten, and literally ban any kind of critical thought. And so I wanted to just affirm that the, the, the work that you're doing is, is important and it's and it is political. You're taking a stand about the value of having this, these multiple dimensions of understanding our histories. Yeah, 100%. Being neutral is not actually neutral. Um, Dr. Rosa? Um, I would I would just encourage everyone based on your position, the position that you're in, the context that you're in, to think about possibilities for 
uh, building relationships across different institutional spaces in order to, you know, to participate in, in community transformation. And so in, in my own work, this has taken many forms. And so I would speak from my experience, but I, I hesitate to provide people with a prescription be, uh, to say, do this specific thing. No, I think you have to evaluate where you are, that what are the struggles in the context where you're located? What are the existing kinds of movements that have been, uh, that people have been working on for a, a long time in the context where you're located and how can you enter into dialogue with those efforts so for me what that looks like for example is I just finished teaching a, an ethnic studies course for, for undergrads in the winter quarter, but I teach my course in a, a local high school, not just at Stanford. And so my university students um, travel to a, a local high school and they are co-learners. We're not tutoring the high school students. I'm collaborating with the teachers and administrators there to co-instruct. And my students and the high school students are conducting the readings together and engaging in discussions together as co-learners so that Stanford doesn't become this isolated elite space for hoarding knowledge, but rather humbles itself in the face of community knowledges that are surrounding it, and rather it recognizes that those communities are in fact uh, in a better position in many cases to evaluate what's going on in their own context. And so we have to humble ourselves in different institutional spaces. In my previous job at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, I, I worked closely with our local community colleges. So I lived in a, a city called Holyoke, Massachusetts, and I collaborated with Holyoke Community College to help create an ethnic studies program at the community college. Um, so uh, uh, local faculty across these spaces work together. And this was intended to create a pipeline from K through 12 schools to the community college to the university to create different opportunities. So we created those ethnic studies programs, not just at the community college, but also in the high schools and in the K through 12 setting as well. Um, and so this relationship building across institutions has been so important. And, and, and finally, um, right now I'm, I'm working, one of another community I work with in Chicago that has, this is a community that was the focus of, of my book, uh, looking like a language sounding like a race. So um, we're just commemorating there the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Puerto Rican Cultural Center and the creation of an alternative high school, which was central to that. And as Dr. Yasso noted, you know, it, it, in the moment when this school was created 50 years ago, the push out rate, not the dropout rate, because dropout frames things uh, as a matter of individual choice, the push out rate for Puerto Ricans in Chicago in the 1970s was in upwards of, of over 70% of students were being pushed out of Chicago public schools. And so the, there was the recognition of the need for alternative schools, um, alternative curricula, teachers who were coming from these community traditions to support these students. And this led to the creation of an alternative healthcare center, housing for the affordable housing for the community across intergenerational affordable housing through the entirety of the lifespan so that we don't dispose of our elders, nope. Um, alternative food cultivation and distribution systems, um, cultural artistic and, and spaces for artistic expression and community expression. Um, and, and so we're, I, I have a grant from the Spencer Foundation with a colleague, Laura Johnson, at Northern Illinois University um, called Community as a Campus. And this, uh, this grant we're using um, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of, of this political movement in Chicago. And so this kind of inter-institutional collaboration um, and, and community building and transformation, this is the work that I would encourage people to experiment with, to think about what, is, what are the struggles in the spaces where you're located and how can you enter into these long-standing efforts Often, if you're just entering into it, you should enter at the back of the line. No, your goal shouldn't be to lead it because you're probably not primed to do so. So my job as a scholar is to enter at the back of the line, not to tell people, oh, my analysis tells me that, you know, I should be leading this effort. No, I need to humble myself. And so, um, yeah, working, working collaboratively, collectively, focusing on transformation and humbly, I think, is, is how I try to, to move through this work. Oh, 100%. I love that. Um, we've gotten two questions, one which was uh, submitted prior to or in advance of this. So I wanted to ask that one first. Um, uh, what was the biggest uh, societal or cultural situation you've experienced that has impacted you indefinitely as an individual? I, I appreciate this question. And I was going to go with two things. <laughs> very briefly uh, uh, in the time that we have, which is hard for academics to do. One is um, I, uh, I look now at critical race media literacy. What does it mean to understand the, uh, how we came to understand ourselves 
through entertainment media in particular. And I look at a lot of films um, and the ways in which I uh, was very influenced and had to unlearn um, how I understood the world through where you're getting information and you think you're being entertained, right? And that's not watching a documentary film. Um, and so I, I do think that that kind of, um, as society's still main narrative, I think that the power of filmmaking, and so for me, that ended up shaping some of my um, working with student filmmakers and trying to help them produce their films and writing scripts ourselves and making sure that we were not reproducing some of the same um, one dimensional portrayals that we had seen growing up. And the second thing that I uh, would say is um, I was on campus during the hunger strike and um, mass collective um, organizing to departmentalize the program of Chicana and Chicano studies as an undergraduate. And my experiences as a student during the, these mass and participating in and um, seeing that there was a group of, they called themselves the conscious students of color. And there were uh, my peers and it really pu has pushed my work, it, not only in my coming to a political consciousness, but also looking for across time and place, the ways in which um, efforts uh, pushing back against inequality has often been interracial and rarely been discussed. We are most often talked about as being in conflict with one another as communities of color. And there are multiple examples of where we have come together to, to understand our common condition and to push against that. And, and so that has really informed a lot of the work that I do um, across time and place, both of those. Great. Um, Dr. Rosa. So, so I'm a, a linguistic and cultural anthropologist by, by training. And I should say that what, what brought me into this field or what made me obsessed with, with linguistics was you know, as a child, I internalized in mainstream schools the idea that the point of school is to fix particular people linguistically and culturally. That, that, you know, some of us, when we come to school, the linguistic and cultural practices that we bring to the classroom are unfit for learning. That's the stereotype. And that, you know, the whole point of school is to correct us. And so I internalized this very much through K through 12 schools, the varieties of Spanish and English. Um, to and through which I was socialized at home. When I entered school, I, I was met with pushback and, and met with the idea that what I was doing was wrong. Uh, and so I thought that I needed to be fixed and that in turn, I needed to help fix my family. So when I started studying linguistics in, as an undergraduate student, um, you know, and, and one of the first things you learn is that there's no such thing as correctness and correctness is a, a you know, linguists study how people use language. We don't tell people how to use language is the idea. Um, my, the, the rug was pulled out from under me. So I started to study structures of Spanglish, what's called Spanglish stereotypically or, or African-American English and, and broader black language patterns. Um, you know, and I, I realized that, so my, my father was from Harlem in New York City and grew up in a predominantly Puerto Rican and African-American context. And he would always ask me, you know, when I would come home from school, whether I had any tesses that day, he would say, did you take any tesses? And I would say, no, dad, but I took several tests and I did very well on them. Thank you. And I would think that I was correcting him. I would say, you don't pluralize the word test as tesses, it's tests. So then, you know, when I started studying these linguistic structures, you learn, for example, that the word test ends in a voiceless consonant cluster, ST, which uh, in the context of African-American language patterns can uh, be communicated without that final, uh, that final consonant, T, so that it's just tests. Um, so so uh, in a voiceless consonant cluster, unlike like uh, buzz, when you say buzz, your vocal cords are vibrating. That's a, a voiced consonant cluster. When you say test, they're not. So in a voiceless consonant cluster, you can delete that T and then you pluralize tests the way that you would pluralize a word like bus, like buses. Um, so a singular school bus becomes multiple school buses. And so tests becomes tesses. So my father was drawing on multiple systems, multiple knowledge systems simultaneously. He knew a pattern of voiceless consonant cluster deletion that's stereotypically associated with African-American language patterns. 
and a pattern of pluralization by adding that S sound onto the end, which is stereotypically associated with mainstream or so-called white English, no such thing, but stereotypically mainstream English. So when I recognize that he knew multiple systems and I thought he knew nothing, my world has never been the same, never been the same. And as I interact with different community spaces, my goal is to figure out what is the knowledge and the brilliance that exists here that I have not been primed to recognize. And in fact, that our mainstream institutions have not been primed to recognize and not just not recognize, in fact, they misrecognize it as deficiency, as problems that need to be fixed. And I wanna think about what world could grow out of honoring and recognizing these knowledges that are all around us. So that is that is what has impacted me and has informed my scholarly work to this day. Um, yeah, I just wanna add like for myself, like the, for me individually, it's definitely COVID as, as a situation that was uh, really impacted me because it laid bare all of these structural problems that we have as a country in such a way that was like so assaultive to my consciousness as I'm sure it was to all of yours. Like all of these things I know as a graduate student, but yet have to stare at them all at the same time happening um, was 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 actually it was like crushing. Um, but at the same time, like being in, in, in quarantine and stuff, I was able to have the time and space to explore my gender, figure out like what is going on with me internally and pursue things that I needed to pursue that would help um, align me within myself. So it's like, again, this like double-edged, uh, two things that are going on that you wouldn't know unless you actually seek to find out what people's experiences were during COVID and like exactly what it's laying there, but also how people are moving through the world during this time. Um, and I just want to make sure to get this last question in. Um, Nancy, uh, and I'm sorry if I butcher their name, P. Wo War said, many of the local historic sites are run by volunteers and are located near community colleges, university colleges. What recommendations would you make to get the academic community to venture into these historic sites to help change the stories told by the volunteers who are working there? If either of you have any thoughts on that? I would just say that, you know, I would seek people out, try to identify people based on their areas of expertise and invite them to come collaborate. I, I think building these, these relationships, it, it should be scholars' responsibility, no, the, but, you know, there's, there's a way in which people are, are, are struck very thin across many, uh, many commitments. And so, but, but seeking people out based on their expertise and being open to the possibility that they might be willing to come collaborate. That was certainly what I was mentioning earlier, my experience at the University of Massachusetts working with Holyoke Community College. I have, I have wonderful colleagues at Holyoke Community College and in K through 12 schools in, in that community. And so the opportunity to do that work to connect these different educational institutions was um, really important for me. So I, I think that there are people who are willing to do this, seek them out based on their, their specific expertise. Awesome, great. Thank you both. Um, thank you both so, so much. And thank you to the New Jersey Historical Commission for inviting us to talk. Um, I believe uh, we're out of time, um, but so thank you. And thank you for everyone who joined us today. I'd just like to echo the thank you and, and thank you everyone for the awesome presentation. A lot of stuff to think about today and, and we're hoping that folks um, return to this video too, or we have it recorded and we hope that this becomes a resource for future generations and also people leading up to the 250th. Um, I, I saw that Dr. Yoso mentioned she would uh, send out some of the resources. There was a request for resources. So uh, for anyone viewing this um, video, we'll attach a list of resources, uh, books, and, and articles that you can read up on to, to continue your own education in this particular subject. Um, so thank you, everyone, today. Um, I hope everyone has a great day.